one time in the dim reaches of the past, Australia and her island neighbors were connected to the Asiatic mainland. Then, as the level of the oceans rose, the land bridge disappeared, cutting off this faraway area from the rest of the world. Thus isolated, a unique population of wildlife, free from outside influences and major predators, continued to develop along primitive lines. And so here, with little change throughout the ages, nature has preserved a sanctuary for her strangest creatures. Still clinging to existence here is the giant bat, so large it's called the flying fox. On muddy tide flats, the lungfish hops about on fins and tail. When the tide comes in, it behaves like a fish again. The frilled lizard vividly recalls that age when reptiles ruled the earth. And only here is found the spiny anteater, or echidna, a creature akin to the reptiles, for it hatches its young from eggs. Also unique to this land is the Tasmanian devil, so named for its ill temper, because its ears turn red when angry. Another native oddity is the tiger cat, misnamed perhaps, for it's more fox-like than feline. Stranger still is the duck-billed platypus, nature's first attempt to make a mammal. His scientific name is Paradoxus, and paradox he is. With a bill like a duck, a tail like a beaver, a body like a reptile, and fur like an otter, altogether he's really like nothing else in all the world. Although not a true amphibian, the platypus is at home in the water, for he feeds on grubs, frogs, and worms. Platypus burrows are dug deep in the bank of a stream. Here, the families are raised. But instead of giving birth to their young, the platypus lays eggs. The incubation period is brief, and newly hatched embryos are so immature, they bear no resemblance to the parent. Eventually, however, features of the adult, including the characteristic duck bill, begin to take shape. The babies are nourished on mother's milk, but the female platypus doesn't nurse her young in the ordinary way. Instead, her breast is covered with hundreds of milk pores, so the young simply lap up the milk from the belly fur of the mother. After about two months, the babies can be left alone. But mother's departure is just what the native cat has been waiting for. Anticipating his scheme, the mother built a barricade in the burrow. First, it appears empty. Then the cat's sharp ears detect sounds, but it can't tell from which direction they come. confused, the cat eventually finds the problem too baffling to cope with. When the babies are old enough to figure out the secret of the false wall, they're also ready to get on with the business of being platypuses, as strange a prospect as ever confronted one of nature's creatures.
while the northern hemisphere basks in the summer sun, July brings winter to the land down under. But the change of season doesn't bother the platypus. Built something along the lines of a toboggan, he finds the going smooth, but too smooth, in fact. Probably the best known natives here are the kangaroos and the wallabies. The bitter cold brings harsh times for all but the very young, called joeys. Being marsupials, they're cozy and comfortable in mother's pouch. Here they remain through spring and on into summer, before they learn to forage for themselves. Following a meal of grass, mother and Joey indulge in primping. After so long a time in such cramped quarters, emerging is like shedding winter woolies. A neighbor of the kangaroos is the emu, Australian version of the ostrich. Despite disturbances, broods of up to 20 young are hatched each year. Stranger still is the fact that the male incubates the eggs. Among the strange creatures here, many are tree dwellers. The bushy-tailed possum is equipped with a prehensile tail that helps him move from limb to limb. Typical of so many of the mammals of this land, the bushy tail is also marsupial. Mammary glands are located inside the pouch so the joeys don't even have to come out for meals. Being raised in a pouch develops a habit of dependence on the mother, a habit that isn't easily broken. Thus encumbered, the mother has to do the climbing for her young as well as for herself. Even offspring from previous litters still insist on clinging to mother's side. Like the possum, the koala is also a tree dweller. From this creature was modeled the teddy bear, although the koala actually isn't related to the bear at all. The koala also has the problem of ditching overgrown youngsters. Her strategy is to set a pace too fast for him to follow. In this land of clinging offspring, a mother wombat also wants to get rid of her youngster. But he won't take the hint, even when she gives him the cold shoulder. Unable to crawl into one entrance, he'll try another. 
It's a tight squeeze, but if he can just get his foot in the door... More primitive even than the pouched animals is the echidna, or spiny anteater. This creature is so low on the evolutionary scale that his mouth is only a hole in his snout, out of which projects his long, sticky tongue. His sharp claws are perfect for burrowing. this shield of bristling bayonets, his neighbors leave him alone. A baby wallaby, however, has to learn his lesson the hard way. To the echidna, a rotten log is sure to yield a meal of ant eggs. To make egg gathering easy, the tongue is coated with a sticky substance to which anything it touches adheres. The echidna's appetite for eggs is seldom satisfied, and he isn't at all particular about who laid them. But there may be more tasty morsels on the other side of the stream. With a natural snorkel, he's at home both above and below the surface. Every creature of this land has unique characteristics. The honey glider, so named due to his taste for nectar, is a species similar to the American flying squirrel. Mothers too enjoy the sport, but don't dare take off overloaded. So today, as in centuries past, the creatures of this land down under pursue their business of survival. For here in this far away and isolated land, nature has preserved a living sanctuary for the strangest of her creatures. Mm -hmm.